Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. First of all, I want to say I hope everyone is doing well and you're heeding the government and health experts recommendations to distance and isolate in order to protect yourself and also to protect our most vulnerable populations. I also hope that you're taking some time to relax, focus, plan, self-educate, and connect by whatever means necessary to your friends and your family in these trying times. I know there's a lot of economic uncertainty right now and so I thought I'd put aside one video that I'd planned to make today and talk a little bit about how we can prepare ourselves for a job loss or an economic hardship or a global health pandemic like the one that we're dealing with right now. I've seen many social media posts of the fear of what comes next for many friends and family who are going to be without income for some time and the prospect of that can be very overwhelming. So I wanted to put together a survival guide to investing in order to protect yourself from something like this derailing you in the future. If you're new to me and my channel, you generally know that I talk a lot about real estate investing, but personal finance is very connected to real estate investing. So it's important that we discuss the two and how they work together in order to be able to set yourself up for success. Before we get into it, I want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. You can hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Step one of the survival guide of investing is tracking your spending. In order to know how much you can save or spend or invest, you have to know where your money's coming from and where it's going to. There's so many great options and tools for tracking your spending and some of them are free and some of them are paid. There's just way too many of them for me to go into detail on every single one. There are apps like Mint and Milo that you can download for your smartphone. There are also other ones out there. So do a little bit of research on what the best app is going to be for the application you want to use it for. There's also software like QuickBooks, which is what I use in my business. In any piece of accounting software, I'm looking for one major feature and that is that you can directly connect your bank accounts to the software. This allows the software to pull the transactions from my banking institution and then I can reconcile them from there. Some financial institutions have their own tracking software, which can be very helpful. I do find these a little bit limiting when it does come to certain features like exporting transactions to your accountant, for instance. You can also go the old school route, which is pulling your transactions from your financial institution and then inputting them into an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Whatever way you decide to go, ultimately what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to see all of your transactions and you want to be able to reconcile them and put them into categories. When you are reconciling your transactions, it's really important that you put in as much detail as you possibly can. For instance, instead of using something very broad like meals or dining out, I like to get a little bit more granular. I like to break things down even further into categories like coffee or alcohol or dining with friends and you'll see why that's important on the next step. Once you've had a chance to break things down and total them up by category, now you can really see where you're spending all of your money. This can be a very interesting exercise. I remember doing this one year and I think I spent about $7,000 on parking in one single year. And about $1,000 of that was parking tickets. Now I was in my vehicle all the time, but I knew it was a simple thing that I could make some small changes and save significant money on a year over year basis. Once you've got everything added up and totaled up, now you're gonna break it down into two simple categories. Your fixed costs, these would be things that you have to have in order to be able to live, like your rent, uh, your utilities, your car, your medications. The other category is discretionary spending, which pretty much is everything else. Now I want you to be really ruthless here. So for instance, your Netflix subscription or your morning latte or your red wine habit, these would all fall under discretionary spending even though I know it doesn't feel like that sometimes. Once you've figured out where everything goes, now you're ready for the next step. After you've had a chance to review all of your spending, now comes step two of the survival guide to investing and step two is reduce your spending. I know, it's no fun. The objective here is to go through line by line and see where you can find some efficiencies on where you're spending your money. Because there's that old saying, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. I've never been a big fan of sayings, but it makes sense. Having said that, I'm also a big believer in keeping everything in perspective. Don't be that person that's tracking every single penny on every single transaction because what ends up happening is people don't really wanna be around you. <laughs> Ultimately, life's too short not to indulge once in a while, but if you wanna be able to do that, just set aside some money every single month, call it a fun account, and then just go out and blow that money on whatever it is that you wanna do. Step two B in the survival guide to investing is paying off any high interest debt. Most credit card companies charge 20% interest on balances that are carried month to month. So make sure you're paying off those high interest credit cards as soon as you possibly can. If you're paying 20% interest on your credit card, you'd have to be earning 20% somewhere else in order to be able to balance that out. And 20% is not an easy number to acquire when it comes to investing. Step three in my survival guide to investing is 
start to build your emergency fund. Your emergency fund should be three to six months of your living expenses that you can access very easily. It should be sitting in cash or in a savings account. If you're looking for a great high interest savings account, you can go to a site called borrowwell.com. I'll leave it in the description below. So you can enter your information into Borrowwell's site and it'll give you recommendations based on your credit rating. For those of you that don't know, if you're checking your own credit rating, it doesn't count as inquiry on your credit, so it won't affect your credit score. Once you've entered your information, then Borrowwell will give you recommendations for credit cards, loans, loans, mortgages, and also you can compare high interest savings accounts and you can figure out which one is best for you. Another option for holding your emergency fund would be in something like a GIC. You just wanna make sure that your GIC has no penalties for early withdrawal and you wanna be able to access that money within 30 days if need be. And for those of you that have rental properties, and I know there's a lot of real estate investors that watch my channel, you wanna make sure that each one of your rental properties has that three to six months of an emergency fund built up as well. So if something happens, you've got that three to six months of your emergency fund before you have to start dipping into your own pocket. Step four in the survival guide to investing is see if there's opportunities to earn more money. I know that sounds easier than it is, but if you can earn more money, you can start to save more money and you can start to invest more money. There is a strategy called the 40-40-20, which is something that a lot of people are striving for. It's pretty easy when you break it down. Essentially what it means is 40% of the money that you earn goes towards the government. You want to get to a position where if you're paying the government 40%, you also want to be paying yourself 40% and putting that aside in savings. And that last 20% of the money that you earn is the money that you're going to be living off of. As I mentioned, this is not an easy thing to do, but if you want to strive for this, you want to give 40% to the government, keep 40%, put it into savings, and when you can live off that 20%, that's when you can start to save money Money and invest on a really proactive basis. The alternative to earning more money is reducing your spending. So if you can get to the 40, 40, 20 by reducing your spending, that's also another way to get there. And my fifth and final step to the survival guide to investing is invest as much money as you possibly can. Now, not all investments are created equal, so I wanna break down what order I think you should invest in if you haven't started investing already. First and foremost, you wanna be able to max out your TFSA, that's your tax-free savings account. Right now, in 2020, the maximum contribution for an individual is $6,000, and the combined contribution limit, if you haven't contributed anything to your TFSA so far, is $69,500. If you're not familiar with a tax-free savings account, and I really don't think it should have been called a tax-free savings account. I think it should have been called a tax-free investment account. That would have really helped clarify things for people and really know what to do with this account. There's a variety of products that you can invest in with a tax-free savings account and essentially you want to maximize this account because it's just like it sounds. If you earn money in this account, you get to earn that money tax-free. The second thing you want to look at is RSP contributions. These are registered retirement savings plans. I got to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of RSPs because a lot of people don't understand them. Many people believe they are tax-free investment accounts, which is not true. They are tax-deferred investment accounts. So if you take money at the end of the year and you contribute that to an RRSP, that gets reduced from your taxable income. You will pay tax on that money, but you'll pay for it when you take that money out of your RRSP, which for most people is around when they're 65 or 70 years old. The idea is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket because you're going to be earning less money. And when you withdraw that RRSP money, you'll be paying less tax on it when you're in a lower tax bracket later in life. The problem I see with most RRSPs is a lot of people invest them in mutual funds and mutual funds are managed by a fund manager. The fund manager generally takes a two to 5% fee on all of the money that you invest and the money that you earn. So whether that fund is going up or whether it's going down, that fund manager still makes their two to 5% fee. And this becomes very difficult to make money over the long term in something like a mutual fund that has a fund manager. Here is my recommendation when it comes to RRSPs. If you have an employer that contributes to your RRSPs every single month and you have an employee match option, I would always recommend contributing whatever you need to do to be able to get that employee match option when it comes to your employer's RSP contribution. I'll do a whole other video on TFSA and RSP investing because there's so many ways we can do this and maximize the money that's sitting in those tax-free and tax-deferred accounts. So after you've got your emergency fund and you've maxed out your TFSA, the next thing you want to look at is start investing in cash-flowing assets. What are cash-flowing assets? Essentially, cash-flowing assets are something that pays you every single month. Some examples of cash-flowing assets would be savings accounts, GICs, bonds, dividend stocks, rental properties, and peer-to-peer -peer lending. There are other cash flowing assets, but these are probably the most popular ones. Which ones you should choose depends on a couple things how quickly you wanna earn money, how much money you have to invest, and what your risk tolerance is. The risk tolerance on a savings account is incredibly low, and so is your return. 
So if you take the rule of 72, the rule of 72 says you take 72, you divide it by your fixed rate of interest. Let's say the bank is offering you a 2% interest on your savings account. You take 72, you divide that by two, it gives you 36. That means it takes 36 years to double your money. If you took $100,000, you invested in a savings account in 36 years, assuming you didn't contribute anything else, you'd have $200,000 in that account. That may not be fast enough for a lot of you. Rental property, on the other hand, has a higher risk if you don't really know what you're doing, but the returns can be significantly higher. On average, I'm trying to target at least a 10% cash on cash return when it comes to my investment properties. And if I have a 10% return, I take 72, I divide by 10, gives me 7.2. Every seven years, I'm doubling my money which is a much faster way to be able to build and to earn and to get you to your financial goals just that much faster. But really it's about what you're most comfortable with and what you're most passionate about. I will say this, I recommend diversifying your portfolio as much as you possibly can. So having money in something that's very liquid, something that's a little more short term, something that's a little bit more long term, and having varying risk tolerances inside of your investment portfolio is the best way to go about it. I hope you guys found this helpful. And if you did, if you can smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm, you can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and as always, leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook, and please come check me out at darrenvoros.com. With that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your investing journey, and above all right now, take care of yourselves, and please stay safe.